So, ladies and gentlemen, what an eventful 24 hours we have had. We are potentially watching history unfold here, and uh, there is a very good chance that this is the start of a second Russian civil war. Probably won't last very long, certainly not as long as the first one, way back at the end of World War I. However, uh, there are some potentially disastrous consequences here if things go a certain way, and that's why everyone who is looking at this and thinking it's a great thing. It's a great thing for the Ukrainians in the short term. However, there is a very good chance that this is a bad thing for the world in the long term. So for anyone who's not been following, um, obviously there is currently war in Ukraine. Russia has uh, invaded Ukraine for the last 18 months and they've been utilizing since the summer of last year a private military group, so essentially mercenaries, called Wagner. Now, Wagner has very close ties to the Russian government. Um, they, you know, first kind of popped up when Russia invaded the Crimea. They were used as a proxy group to uh, to invade Crimea and allow Russia to hold its hands up and say, hey, it wasn't us, it was these, you know, mercenaries that we don't know who hired them, when in actuality, you know, Russia did hire them. Uh, they've got a reputation for being brutal. They have a lot of neo-Nazi links. Uh, their original founder was a uh, quite, um, you know, prominent neo-Nazi, Dmitry Utkin, um, but he kind of disappeared in 2016. And uh, the current leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, has been running his mouth for a, a little while now, criticizing the Russian military um, and, you know, more recently, the war itself, which is a big no-no in Russia. If anyone anyone knows anything about Russia, you know, if you want to get thrown out of a window, all you've got to do is speak up and criticize the war, um, which has happened to a lot of people. And so, you know, obviously, this has moved fast, faster than I think anyone could have imagined. It went from yesterday morning, Prigozhin, jumping online, making another one of his angry videos, but the difference in this was that he wasn't shouting at the Russian military directly. He was criticizing the entire war. He was talking about how the Ukraine hadn't been bombing civilians in the Donbass for the last eight years. They'd only been bombing Russian military positions, which is true. You know, any idea of there being a Donbass genocide are completely unfounded. But the Russian defenders, the Russian bots, the trolls, they will always sit there and say, oh, there was a genocide of civilians in the Donbass and that's why Russia invaded. It's not true. And, you know, here's Prigozhin, you know, who, you know, is not necessarily the nicest guy in the world, but I think he is probably a fairly honest and upfront guy, because he's never minced his words, saying that, you know, the war was unjustified. He's called the war stupid constantly and criticised the lack of organisation, the lack of ammunition, um, you know, and, and has generally been quite an open critic of everything. But yesterday it really kind of took one step further because he essentially said that Russia was in the wrong. And that got everyone up and thinking, Jesus, that's that's going to be the end of this guy. He's definitely going to be falling out of a, uh, a window or falling down the stairs now or sipping some poison. And instead, within six hours, it was reported that, I mean, and, and it was another video that came out that essentially said Prigozhin had turned his troops away from Ukraine and into Russia. And that's exactly what's happened over the last 12 hours they have sped through the southwest of Russia like lightning, and they are halfway from the Ukrainian border to Moscow. They've taken over two districts, and apparently there's been minimal resistance, but there's definitely been some fighting. I've seen videos of helicopters bombing um, their convoy. I've seen, you know, um, shot down helicopters, you know, so there is some infighting going on, but a lot of the Russian military has stood aside, which makes me think this has been pre-planned. He's had the agreements of several of the uh, the Russian top brass who have ordered their troops to stand down. Or, what's possibly worse for Putin, is that the troops don't believe in Putin anymore. They're tired and fed up, and they've stood down voluntarily. That's a very bad thing for Vladimir Putin. Because the Wagner Group only has 25,000 soldiers at the moment. And yes, they are battle-hardened. I mean, a lot of them are criminals. You've got to remember that. A lot of them will have been recruited from prisons in Russia... So they've got their own reason for fighting because they know once they stop fighting, there's a chance that they might go back to jail. They're not supposed to, but there's a chance. So they're going to try and get rid of the guy at the top of the government, you know, the government who put them in jail in the first place, you know, rightly or wrongly, whatever it might be. 
And so, you know, now the decisive point is these next sort of 24 to 48 hours as they will encroach closer and closer to Moscow. Because obviously the closer they get to Moscow, the more they might face off against loyalist Putin forces. And so there is the potential that this is going to be a very destructive and bloody period for, you know, the Russian population. And, you know, you'd never want to see any civilians get hurt. But at the same time, this feels like a little bit of karma, given how, you know, Russia has so violently and, um, you know, just complete, you know, just completely unprovoked has attacked many, many Ukrainian civilians and killed thousands of Ukrainian civilians. The Russians now find themselves facing the, their own threat from their own doorstep. You know, so it is a little bit of karma for the Russian people for not standing up against this war and, you know, for them buying into all that propaganda. At the same time, you never want to see anyone innocent get hurt. But this is the unfortunate result of sitting by and letting, you know, a fascist dictatorship do whatever they want in your own country. Um, so, you know, again, the potential outcomes here is that, you know, Putin stops the coup. Um, the best thing for us is that, you know, that does weaken the Russian forces in Ukraine because they no longer have those soldiers from the Wagner Group to use. Um, and that's a lot of soldiers on the front line, 25,000. That's not going to be easy to replace. Uh, also, there is the period at which this coup is ongoing. There is going to be a lot of chaos in the Russian defense lines. So it wouldn't surprise me if we saw Ukraine really push their main counterattack whilst this is all going on and make see them make massive gains. Because again, as I mentioned, there's the potential that the Russian forces will not be able to get supplied uh, because the entire southwest of that Russian border is cut off by Wagner Group. So if Wagner Group decides to say, we're not letting any Russian vehicles across the border to resupply, those Russian soldiers are on their own. Um, likewise, you know, again, there might not be communications or orders coming up from the top. And the way the Russian military works is very much a uh, direct structure. The The sort of unit commanders are not giving any autonomy to make their own decisions. They have to obey decisions from the top. If a top military general says to a commander of, you know, a squad, you must push on forward into this death trap, they are bound to do that. They can't countermand it. You know, they, they could certainly try and refuse it, but that would face, you know, very severe consequences. So, you know, there is going to be a very, very good opportunity for Ukraine to push an advantage in the short term. Now, the second option is that Prigozhin and the Wagner Group are able to topple Putin, and there is a massive power struggle, and no one for a good while is able to establish themselves as the next leader of Russia. Now, that might well again cause the collapse of the Russian front line in Ukraine and their ultimate withdrawal. However, it leaves again a lot of uncertainty at the top of the Russian government. Um, and you never know exactly who is going to get into power and who might be better or worse than Putin. Worst case scenario is that Prigozhin and the Wagner Group topple Putin and they take power. Now, you have to remember, Prigozhin is not a good man. He is an evil, evil man. He is a man who is paid to kill. His group has tortured and maimed innocent people, children and women. You know, they've been they've been fighting in Africa, in Syria, in Ukraine, all at the whim of Putin. Um, you know, so they are not, by any stretch of the imagination, a good group of people made up of criminals. You know, again, mercenaries very rarely are good people. And so if they were to take power, you know, don't expect the war to stop. That's the whole point. They don't want the war to stop. They want the war to continue on in a way that, you know, Russia uses every tool at its you know, disposal. Prigozhin was calling for the use of tactical nukes at the beginning of the war. That's a major, major problem. If he gets into power, he controls the five or 6,000 nukes that Russia has. Now, all of those nukes are not going to be capable of launch, you know, I'd expect maybe a third of their nuclear arsenal to be ready for use. But that is still, you know, 1,500 nukes, which is enough to completely wipe out um, you know, civilization. It's it's not good news for anyone. If a tactical nu nuke is used in Russia in uh, Ukraine, that's pretty much end game. You know, that's the point at which now America is trying to get NATO to agree that if there is a tactical nuke used, then they invoke Article Five, they get involved, and it's World War Three. 
So essentially, nuclear, nuclear weapons equals World War Three in that scenario. And in that scenario, I'd say it's 90% certain that Prigozhin will use them because he has got nothing to lose, you know, if he's at the top of the Russian government at that point. He needs to... He will need to deliver something very quickly to solidify his power because, again, whilst he is the top man in this Wagner group and they could possibly depose Putin, there is still a lot of oligarchs, there's still a lot of top military brass that he will have to contend with and they will be gunning for his head. So he needs to firmly cement his place at the top. Now, these are all hypotheticals. I still think the most likely outcome is that the coup will fail but fail in a bloody, bloody way. And I think that there's going to be a lot of fighting just outside of Moscow. Um, either way, like I say, this is good in the short term for Ukraine because it will give them an advantage to push forward. But we really have to be wary of the overall outcome here. Um, either way, this has been a long time coming. You know, Putin has set himself up very much like, you know, um, a lot of dictators, Mussolini, Gaddafi, you know, Saddam Hussein, they all put themselves into positions where to be the top man, they have to turn everybody below them against each other. And eventually someone is going to look at that and think, you're incompetent, I'm going to rise up and punish you. Now, the other time, the other way it normally goes is the people tend to rise up, but I think the Russian people are so indoctrinated at the moment that they really are not going to be at that point of rising up against Putin, you know. Um, until things really start to hit the fan, the Russian people are going to stay dormant. And, you know, there, there are those people who are trying, but they're just nowhere near enough in number um, for that to be effective. So, yeah, it's a very it's a sticky situation, but it's a good development in the short term for the Ukrainians. I think this is the decisive moment in the Ukrainian war where they will be able to push home a big advantage, reclaim a lot of the lost land, and ultimately take Russia out of the fight. Um, but the internal consequences in Russia itself could possibly lend to a disaster if things go a certain way. Um, either way, it's not good for Russia. Um, it's probably not good for the wider world, because, you know, again, a power gap in a country of that size with nuclear weapons is never good. And even if Putin survives and stays in power, it might just tip him over the edge. You know, who knows, he's he's already a bit deranged and, you know, he's not getting any younger and he might see that and start to get even more paranoid and he might start to use nukes. So we've got to be very careful, but um, I'm going to be watching with bated breath. It's exciting as at the same time as it is quite, you know, nerve wracking, but uh, that's, that's the way of warfare. Either way, I hope the Russians and Putin get what is coming to them for this horrendous war and all of the war crimes that they've committed so we'll see i'll try and keep everyone updated if i can but i just wanted to talk for you know what the uh the consequences are for those who might not necessarily be in the loop so thank you for watching as always i'll see you for the next one